Krishnan Srinivasan, Nasreen Sattar, please take your seats. Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for your attendance. Um, uh, it's my pleasure to be with uh, Nasreen Sattar, and uh, she has written this book, my Kabul story, uh, about her days in Kabul. And um, I should really leave her to do most of the talking, but um, after all, it's her story. But I'd like to say that um, she was a banker. Uh, she joined uh, an important uh, foreign bank, foreign to the subcontinent anyway, uh, in 1986. And uh, 20 years later, uh, she found herself as the CEO of uh, a global bank in Afghanistan, the first global bank, I think, which was established there. And she was the first woman CEO of that bank and probably the first woman CEO of any bank in Afghanistan. And uh, we're thinking now, we're looking at 2016, 20, 2007, 2008, 2009, when she was there. Now, uh, Afghanistan uh, was already uh, a country uh, of great tension. Uh, the Taliban had been evicted, but they were in the process of uh, making a resurgence. There were several terrorist uh, attacks and um, atrocities in Afghanistan, including in Kabul. And therefore, it's uh, something really quite uh, unique for uh, a lady from our part of the world, uh, Nasreen is Bangladeshi, uh, to go to Kabul uh, on this kind of assignment. So I'll invite her first to tell us uh, in what circumstances she went there, was she apprehensive, and um, um, uh, how did um, her various colleagues uh, in the bank, in Bangladesh, her relatives, how did they feel about it? But before that, I'd like to say that the bank's name is not ever mentioned in this book. And uh, perhaps she should tell us why and whether we have any difficulties in mentioning the name of the bank now. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank all of you for being here and um, to thank the Kolkata Literary Meet for giving me this opportunity. And also uh, thanks to Krishnan Srinivasan, who has agreed to be uh, the main part of our discussion today. And uh, yes, um, it's for me, it's a big opportunity to be part of this uh, prestigious event. And I participated in the Dhaka Lit Fest, which happened in November. And so for me, it's like a jump forward. Um, as Krishnan said that uh, I became the CEO for Standard Chartered Bank in Afghanistan. And the way it happened was I had already done, I think in 2016, I had already done 20 years of banking with uh, Standard Chartered Bank. And when I had joined in 1986, I was the first woman to be uh, part of the management of that bank. The bank wanted to change its profile of being a male-dominated bank, and so they started hiring women. Anyway, so after 20 years, and I wanted to aspire um, to go further in the bank, and my last position before I went to Afghanistan was regional head for development organizations in Bangla based in Bangladesh, but I was looking after all the countries in South Asia, like uh, India, Sri Lanka, Nepal, and Afghanistan was part of South Asia in the bank's uh, uh, portfolio. So um, I remember how I was offered the job. I was at a, a dinner at a, in Dhaka, and I, the, the then CEO for Standard Chartered Bank approached me and he said, uh, Nasreen, have you had a glass of wine? And I said, yes, but why do you ask that? He said, I'm going to ask you a question and I want an answer within 24 hours. And the question was, uh, would you like to go to Afghanistan as the CEO? And obviously I thought I was joking because I'd never ever thought I'd become a CEO. 
of a multinational bank and that too of a country like Afghanistan. So anyway, he asked me that I should give him an answer within 24 hours. So of course, I went home, asked my husband, my mother, my daughters, everybody, and everybody was kind of very happy about it. Of course, the danger element was always there, but um, in my heart, I knew I wanted to go. And that's how I kind of decided to go, but that was not the uh, end of it. I had to go through several interviews before they finally selected me. I had to convince our regional head who sat in Mumbai uh, as to why being a woman, I would like to go to uh, uh, such a difficult country like Afghanistan. And he said, you don't have any CEO uh, experience. And I told him, there is always a first time. And uh, for a woman, I thought it was a great opportunity for me to take up that position. So I landed in Afghanistan in February of 2007. Well, that's really interesting. I noticed also um, that you never mentioned the name of the bank, even then. Oh. <laughs> Do you have any problem with that, or um, can well, you know who that bank is? I had a problem with the name of the bank when I was writing uh, my book. My book started um, as a journal which I had maintained in, uh, well, I was in Kabul, maybe we'll talk about it later. And so when I converted into a book and I was uh, about to publish it, I thought, and everywhere in the book I had mentioned the name of the bank. So I thought I uh, will go and ask the bank, the bank that I worked for, whether I could use the name. And uh, when I asked them, they said, uh, you can't use the name unless our corporate affairs in London approves of it. Because being a CEO, you were privy to a lot of confidential matters. And uh, the, you may write about things which are confidential. So we suggest um, if you want it to be approved by the corporate affairs, you have to send your book to London. And it will take a lot of time for them to clear your name. So just go ahead. Don't put the name of the bank and write, write of it as a British bank. And everybody will know what, which the bank is. But today, as I speak to you, I don't think um, uh, it's, uh, it's any longer an issue. So the bank was Standard Chartered Bank. So, so finally, we've, we've prized <laughs> the name uh, out of the author. That's great. Now, did you, uh, this book is basically, as you said, uh, um, your diary of that period. Yes. Do, you, do you normally keep a diary? I mean, this is something, I mean, you're going to write up today's events in your diary? Normally, no, I don't keep a diary. When I arrived in Afghanistan, uh, an American friend of mine just suggested that you are in this country and, you know, why don't you just maintain a journal? Write whatever happens, you know, the whole day and just jot it down. Because uh, a time may come when you would like to read back and see what you went through. So I started writing from the very first day that I, in fact, arrived there and I was given a diary. It was beginning of the year, so all the diaries were floating around and I started writing and every single night I wrote, whatever happened, whether it was meaningless or whether something important happened or I wrote down every bit in, in my diary and it became kind of a part of my go, uh, ritual before going to bed. And so I was able to capture everything in my diary, you know, every little bit for which today, you know, my book is there because of the diary. Yes, and I think uh, people are interested in your book, and I hope you don't mind my saying this. I think there's a USP, a, a particular um, quality that uh, is in this book, uh, and that is uh, because you're a woman. And I think if the book had been written by a man, my Kabul story, yawn, yawn, you know, no one would have cared two hoots about it. Now, you were a, a lady, you were the head of that bank, it was the only global bank, and you were undoubtedly the only head of a bank in Afghanistan which was led by a woman. I think these are very significant features, but then I'd like to get more into this. Um, was there a uh, I won't say a problem. I mean, let us tell us about um, your being a woman there in a male-dominated society, um, that uh, you had your fellow bankers, you had the central bank, you had your own staff, and uh, uh, both at, in the bank and at home, and uh, you had, uh, I suppose you had to deal with the police and local officials. Now, I 
presume that they were significantly all men or nearly all men. Now, how did you, um, how did you manage that? Um, I suppose it depends, uh, a lot depends on your own attitude. I went with the attitude I knew Afghanistan to be a male-dominated society, conservative, conservative men. And um, so I went with the attitude that I was uh, not going to, even if they were uh, difficult, I was not going to let it affect me. And surprisingly, when I first arrived, in fact, the very first day that I arrived, I still remember it was a very, very cold day, and I was hugging onto my coat, and I and arrived at the uh, Kabul airport, and I was standing right at the back, and a very nice uh, uh, gentleman, uh, uh, Kabul uh, airport official came up, and he said, ma'am, why don't you go in the front? And that in itself was like, for me, a very welcoming uh, gesture. And, um, and I said that I have to uh, get rid of a lot of uh, the preconceived notions that I was thinking of, that I, it was going to be difficult for me. Of course, when I arrived, um, our bank had, uh, there were already six female uh, local staff. Then we had um, staff from Gambia, from Nepal, and of course, from a lot of uh, young men from uh, Afghanistan itself. Uh, initially, I think I had a lot of uh, challenges because they probably thought I wasn't capable of doing the job. And um, so, you know, like uh, I decided that uh, being a CEO was something new to me and that I wasn't uh, going to fail at it. So what I did is the first month or so, I learned everything. I went from department to department. I learned every part of the bank's job. So I was able to delegate it. Then um, there were about 24 banks, and as Krishnan said, you know, they were, all the heads of the banks were uh, male. Uh, and uh, I thought that it was going to be difficult for me to mingle with the men. And initially, there were awkward moments when I felt they probably didn't think I would be good enough. But uh, it was up to me to prove to them. And soon I could feel that, uh, you know, I was part of the part of them, and I never felt that I was a woman and that they were men. And of course, the central bank governor, the central bank officials, I found out that they were very polite, very welcoming, very helpful. And um, so, you know, like um, I started within uh, months, I started feeling very comfortable there. People were very warm, very uh, helpful. Uh, the very he your head of security in uh, Dubai. Uh, when you first met him, he said that I had serious reservations about a woman coming to this job. Isn't that right? Yes. The, uh, the head of his security was you from... managed to win him over. Yes, well. the head of security was from Pakistan. His name was Ahmed and he was based in Dubai. And he was the regional head of security for all these countries around, especially Afghanistan. So I had spoken to him many times before I took over the job. And, uh, and somehow he felt uh, the bank was wrong in appointing me a, a woman in this uh, position because it would make his job harder. You know, like uh, security in Afghanistan is always so volatile and so uh, difficult. So when he first came to visit me in Afghanistan and we had a nice long one-to-one -one chat and uh, he said, well, I've met you. I'm happy you are here, and I have full confidence in you. So I was kind of like able to win him over. Was it uh, helpful to you that you were Muslim? In some ways, yes, because uh, especially dealing with police people, or we had to deal with them because of all the fraudulent activities that were going on. And as soon as they would know I was a woman, they would call me Bahen, Bahen or sister, you know. And they would know I was Muslim and I was from Bangladesh. So there was immediately that feeling of, uh, you know, kind of that she's a Muslim sister, you know. It helped. Uh, it helped a bit, yes. It did help. Somewhere in your book you say that um, um, women in the corporate sector uh, don't usually relate well to each other. There's always a degree of friction and there's a degree of competition. Now, um, uh, that's what you say in the book. Uh, have you had second thoughts about that? Yes, I have had second thoughts about it. I don't think, in some ways, yes, women tend to be uh, more rigid when they're bosses. And I think there is always this uh, feeling of uh, 
competition amongst women. But when I first went to the bank in Afghanistan, there was a Nepalese girl. And I felt that uh, initially she was a little bit uh, wary about having a woman as a boss. But with time, it's actually I've realized in life it's all up to you. If you want to do anything, you can do it. So I won her over and, and you know, very soon I, there was no friction and we could all work together happily. Uh, well, um, shall we move now to um, uh, the local scenario in Afghanistan? It's uh, sometimes hard for us to remember that uh, 70 years ago, Afghanistan was our neighbor in India. And uh, uh, so much has happened since then, and uh, there's so much detachment now, uh, literally, geographically, physically, uh, people to people-wise that uh, very few Indians know a great deal about Afghanistan. And very few people, I suspect, in this hall, in this, uh, uh, in this um, session, uh, would have been there. And it's a, it's a country which is uh, tremendously fascinating for India, partly because we know so little about it. So uh, can you take us uh, through perhaps some of your experiences locally, um, local Afghans, um, your uh, weddings, which you mentioned, uh, some social scenes when you were with the Afghans. But I, I'd like particularly you talk about the bazaar, um, uh, the events which brought you in touch with the Afghan people. Yeah, well, um, I always still think of Af Afghanistan as a magical country, you know, and uh, as uh, I... I I think it took me just about a month to fall in love with this country because of the people, everything around it, the buzzing, despite all the security situations, we would still, I would still make sure that I went to the local bazaars, you know, and we'd of course had to cover our head with big chadars and pretend we were Afghans and local people. And uh, for me, it was a big opportunity to know the local people, the way their lives were, and um, there was so much of abundance of fruits and nuts, and there were beautiful rose plants, and the softer side of Afghanistan so appealed to me that I, I forgot that this country was going through so much of turmoil, there was so much going on, and, uh, and of course, uh, the people of Afghanistan, my driver Farid, who kind of became my, like my man Friday. I mean, like he was so trusted. I would, he would take me anywhere and I would feel safe with him. Then I had my maid, a young 21-year-old girl who was from the Hazara tribe. I don't know if any of you know about the Hazara tribe. They are a minority in Afghanistan, but they are very, very hardworking. And when she joined me as a maid, she was, I think, about 22 years old. She already had three children, but... Um, Till today, I'm still uh, in touch with her or with my driver. This is what people there, kind of that affection and that connection I had with them. And, uh, and of course, the food, uh, which a lot of people reading my book uh, said that you only wrote, write about uh, eating, you only write about the food. You are constantly writing about going to Chicken Street, which is a, a market. And um, I know I do write a lot about that because those are the things which captured my heart. But uh, of course, we did a lot of work too. The bank did very good business. And although we were not into lending, we were not, our group did not allow us to go into lending because there were no commercial laws in place, but we did make good money there. And um, we were quite, quite a successful bank. Uh, you met the Afghan cricket team and the Afghan cricket team is very popular in India and probably in Bangladesh also. In what circumstances did you meet the Afghan cricket team? Oh, the, uh, Standard Chartered Bank always uh, sponsored, uh, sponsored uh, things like cricket matches and so on. So when I arrived in Afghanistan, I found out that we were also uh, sponsors of the Afghan cricket team. And so one morning I was invited to visit the cricket team in the stadium. And I went there, and there were this line of young cricketers all in their uniforms standing there to greet me because uh, we were one of the sponsors. And I remember uh, shaking hands with each and every one of them. And I never knew at that moment that this cricket team would be such a success cricket team. And, um, and I wish we 
Our group did not have that kind of money to sponsor it in a big way. Um, the way we sponsored it, it, we built their dressing rooms, we gave them uh, tour money, but uh, there were other big, bigger multinational companies which came over later on and took over, which was sad for me. But uh, on that particular day, they, you know, shaking hands with the team, which became a very famous team later on. I still remember it very fondly. Um, what uh, language did you use when you communicated with the local people there? Uh, my broken Urdu, I would say. A lot of them spoke English. The staff in the bank all spoke fluent English. They were well educated. But uh, other than that, I think each and uh, mostly every Afghan spoke uh, Urdu. And I could, Urdu or Hindi, and I could manage. I had enough uh, knowledge of uh, Urdu or Hindi to go by and you didn't uh, pick up any dari at all i picked up a little bit of dari because i made sure that when my maid would come in the morning we spent about an hour and she'd sit and tell me all the stories about her life about lives of all the other young afghan women and at the same time she would try and teach me dari and i would join down points like chitor hastit which meant how are you those little things i wish i had continued i wish i had you know, learned more than I did, but um, I did try and learn a little bit of Dari. You set up, your, your bank set up an ATM in the presidential palace. Did you ever meet uh, President Karzai? No, unfortunately not, because uh, I sh if I had tried, maybe I could have. It didn't uh, strike me that I should, an appointment with President Karzai takes a long time for the clearance and everything. But we set up an ATM inside the presidential palace because the palace guards opened their accounts with us and they were, they were all given debit cards by our bank so that they could take out their salary from the ATMs. And when I went there, I met uh, President Karzai's chief of staff and I asked him whether it was possible for me to meet the president. But by then, it was nearly towards the end of my term. And he said, uh, well, Nasrim, we are sorry, but... Uh, you should have given us more notice. So that's an unfortunate thing that... There's I, a section in your diary, uh, or in your book, which uh, relates to location ships. Now, this is not a, um, a term that uh, we are really very familiar with. Uh, would you like to explain very briefly what that's about? Uh, that <laughs> when anybody read my book, somehow that chapter of my book became a kind of uh, an interesting chapter. Uh, it, location ships is like having a relationship, a man-woman kind of thing. And um, Afghanistan was like a single posting um, country where no spouses were allowed because of the security situ situation. So everybody was single. And, and of course, it was um, uh, places where people got to meet each other. So there were, uh, I had a neighbor who was uh, up to date with what was happening and everything. So I went to have dinner with him one night and he said, Nasreen, do you know, do you remember meeting this Bangladeshi major the other evening? I said, yes. He said, well, he is, um, he's had a, he's having a relationship with this Indian lady and now it's time for him to go back home. And so that's the end of it. So I decided to ask another Bangladeshi girl who lived, uh, who worked for the World Bank and lived across my house, that what is this location ship all about? And so she said that, well, you know, it is a call location ship because people are on single status and they meet and it's a lonely country. So they meet and, uh, you know, the, a relationship starts and uh, it ends as soon as the, uh, the term of their work finishes. And in some cases, if both parties are single, it leads to marriage. And uh, so that's what location ship is. And uh, it, uh, it, it was, it happened in Afghanistan. So, um, lonely hearts and heartbreaks. <laughs> lonely Good. hearts and Okay, so I think let's, let's move on. You've got a very sort of um, uh, favorable, rosy picture of Kabul. Let's move on to a little bit of the darker side. Um, very shortly after you arrived, um, you visited a woman's jail. And uh, that was really uh, not a nice experience, I gather, for you. Uh, can you tell us how you got to visit this jail and what actually happened there? It was actually less than a month after I'd arrived in uh, Kabul. 
and uh, the women affairs uh, representatives came to call on our bank to ask us for donations for the for the women prisoners in Kabul jail. And I thought about it and I said, instead of giving donation, I said, what, what are you going to do with the money? They said, we're going to buy soaps and shampoos and uh, biscuits and towels for the women in the jail. So instead of giving them the money, I don't know why I thought of it. I said, uh, well, why don't we uh, buy the things ourselves and go with you to the jail? It would be an opportunity for us, you know, to give these things to the women prisoners ourselves. So I thought it was a very good idea. So my colleague and I, we went and bought all the shampoos and the soaps and whatever biscuits and everything. And the following uh, morning, the, the women from the Kabul Affairs Ministry came along and we all went off to the jail. They went in their car and me and my two of my, in fact, girl colleagues went. And my driver, Farid, somehow was not very happy about this expedition because he said that, why should you be going to the Kabul jail? It's not such a safe place. But uh, I was new in the country and I thought, well, it's something, you know, I felt like doing and something. So anyway, we went to the jail and um, the huge big jail door opened and the guards came and put a blue stamp on our hands. And then after the first gate, there was another second gate. And then after that, we had to go a while till we came uh, to the women's jail. But on the side, I saw a huge building and I asked my driver, uh, Farid, Farid, what is this building for? Who, who lives here? He said, well, the Taliban's. This is the jail for the Taliban's. And at that moment, I felt fear. I said, I mean, so near to where the Taliban's are and what if somebody broke out? All these silly things came into my head. Anyway, we finally managed to reach the women's jail and uh, because we were carrying all these food stuff and things, where as soon as the gate door was open, everybody came and kind of literally trampled us. You know, they wanted all these things. And they were little, little children also. By default, they were there because their uh, mothers were there. And the, the crimes were very uh, moral crimes, like if somebody didn't agree to marry somebody or if somebody carried on an affair, these women had, you know, the, the crimes were uh, very minor to what they were, had to go through. So finally, after going through all that, we finally managed to come out. And as we were coming out of the gate, the, door was, the gate door was locked and they were, the guard was missing. And for a moment, there was real fear in us that what if the guard doesn't come to open the, we were stuck inside the jail. So eventually the guard sauntered in and opened the gate. And as we came out and went through the mud road, we just sighed, uh, you know, it was such a relief that and my driver said, ma'am, you should never have gone there, you know. But at that time, I was new and uh, I didn't want to listen to him. Well, that takes us uh, very nicely to the security situation in Afghanistan. I mean, we all know um, how bad it is now. I think just a couple of days ago, there was an attack on a, the Intercontinental Hotel. Several people died. Um, and it, wasn't, it was better, of course, but not that much better, even in 2007. So um, there were bombs, there were suicide b bombers. Uh, your driver, I think, had his car um, smashed by a yeah. suicide bomber. Uh, the day when you first arrived in Kabul, uh, you, your bank had a $3 million um, theft. Uh, quite likely, you may not have decided to stay on in Kabul if anyone had died in yeah. that attack, but no one actually died. Um, but the money had gone. And um, I think that shortly after you arrived, uh, the windows of your hotel um, um, uh, vibrated uh, with, a, uh, with a bomb blast. So um, in all this, of course, we know that, um, that foreign banks would be well protected. You had your own security person from Dubai, which you mentioned earlier. You also had a local security organization. But in the end, um, you were fairly skeptical about the arrangements. For example, you had various exit routes from the office and your house, which kind of ended nowhere. So could you tell us, uh, you, you, I think, chose to ignore quite a few of these security recommendations. Do you, when you look back on it, do you think you were foolhardy? Uh, in some ways, yes, but because nothing happened to me, and nothing happened to any of my bank colleagues. I feel that uh, uh, going to Afghanistan and not be able to see more of it, you know, 
just for security reasons, just going to work and home wasn't what I intended to do. And yes, um, I did break a lot of rules because we were not allowed to go out in the evenings, but uh, we did go out to restaurants and I had no idea that uh, this side of life existed in Afghanistan. I was told my, by, my, by the previous CEO that when you come, just bring your chadars and office work because that's, your life is going to be just work and home. But it wasn't. I was uh, going out a lot and there was a very uh, nice uh, social life going on there at that time. The British ambassador had a huge ball and we all went there. I mean, things which I never thought I would be able to uh, go and see in Afghanistan. And of course, uh, as I write in my book that uh, there were bomb blasts all the time, but somehow you became so blase about it, you know. Uh, in the morning, there would be a bomb blast and I'd heard that it happened just around the corner of our of our house, and within an hour or so, I'd feel calm again. I said, it's just part of life in Afghanistan. And, uh, and what I did, I never allowed the fear factor to overcome me, because uh, if you felt fear, you could not have uh, lived there. And I was happy there for two and a half years, and, uh, and despite everything, and uh, life just went on. And uh, uh, Krishnan, if you allow me, would you? Or shall I do it later? I wanted to read a little bit. I want to read uh, a little bit of a bomb attack which uh, really kind of affected me. And uh, it's... Uh, it's just about two pages. Uh, while you're checking that reference, can I just say that... Uh, um, uh, you mentioned meeting the Indian military attaché uh, in your book. Yes. Uh, we had a military attaché. Many of our embassies have uh, military advisors. And uh, Nasreen, I think you met our military advisor there. Uh, but unfortunately, um, after a few days after you met him, uh, he lost his life. Uh, could you just uh, sure. mention that? Sure. Before I read out, I'd like to, because that was... Uh, Something which really, I still remember that day, it was the 4th of July, and there was um, the 4th of July celebrations at the American Embassy, and we had to stand in a long line to go and meet the ambassador to pay our greeting. And as I was standing in the line, there was this very tall uh, man in uniform with a lady in sari next to him, and I knew he must be from South Asia. And somehow the line was moving so slowly that uh, we had this opportunity to talk and he said, uh, he introduced himself as Brigadier Mehta and, um, and his wife. And um, so he said that, oh, uh, since you live um, here and you're working here, why don't you come over for a home cooked meal at our place? I said, I'd love to. And we exchanged our telephone numbers, our emails, and we walked along and we talked for quite a while before we finally uh, went to the end of the line. And as I was leaving, I met him again. And he said, Nasreen, I'll be seeing you soon. I'll call and we'll set up a meeting and I'll see you soon. And soon after that, about four days after that, um, I was at work and I heard a huge blast. And uh, our security people, we had a foreign security uh, company looking after us, and uh, this person's name was David. David called and he said, Nasreen, are you all in the bank? There's been a huge big blast at the Indian Embassy. And uh, my heart stopped beating when I, when I heard Indian Embassy. And as the news started filtering in, somehow I had saved uh, Brigadier Mehta's phone number in my cell phone. I said, uh, let me check if, if everything is all right, because I'd heard that a suicide bomber full of uh, uh, bombs had uh, gone inside the embassy and there was a car just arriving with two officers and uh, the car got blown up and the officers died. And I was hoping in my heart that um, Brigadier Mehta, because I knew him, you know, I know any life is important. And I kept calling him and there was no response from his phone and uh, eventually uh, I found out that he was one of the people who died. And um, I was so sad and I said that, uh, I thought to myself that we make so many plans, we make so many 
uh, programs to meet, but none of us know what's going to happen. And in a place like Kabul, you know, you never know. One minute you're there, the next minute something happens, you know. So that really affected me very much, uh, the passing away of Brigadier Mehta. You want me to read? It's another... Uh, Uh, when I first arrived in Afghanistan, before I moved to my home, I was staying at the Serena Hotel, which was like a hotel which was supposed to be uh, so secure, so secure that, um, I mean, you could be inside and you knew that nothing is going to happen to you because of all the barriers of security and so on and so forth. So after I'd moved into my house, one day my, uh, I'll just read out that part of my book if you'd uh, allow me to. It was uh, January 16, 2008. It was nearly 5 p.m. when I got home. The days had become shorter, and by 4.30 p.m., it started getting dark. Although I loved the sight of the snow from my bedroom window, I didn't care much for the cold winter days in general. The layers of clothes that I had to wear, along with the absence of proper central heating in our house, made me yawn for warmer days. On this particular evening, I invited my senior bank colleagues to come to my living room at home to share any updates they had and also to ask if anyone had any interesting stories to tell. The two little heaters were not enough to warm the room, so we wrapped ourselves in our jackets, woolen scarves and socks, and sipped hot coffee while I briefed them on my interesting meeting with the congressman. Suddenly, there was a loud blast. We looked at each other for a brief moment, but continued with our conversation. If you lived in Kabul, you got used to the sounds. As time went by, my fear of sounds like this had diminished. It was amazing how blase we could become. My cell phone rang, and it was David from our security company at home, and that he called to ask that all local staff had also left for home. He informed us that the Serena Hotel was under attack, and that under no circumstances were we to go out. We had a lovely evening at this hotel two days back. I was sure there was some mistake. The Serena was a very safe location with all its layers of security and checks, or so I thought. We turned on the TV and watched CNN and BBC. Sure enough, the unbelievable was happening as the news unfolded and David kept giving us updates. The notorious Taliban had made their mark and proudly claimed responsibility. For the first time I arrived, I felt fear and sadness. The Serena had been my home for more than a month and a place I frequented often. I used to call it my second home. I knew the staff well and I knew there would be casualties. People I knew would be dead. The front gate with all its barricades and armed security was no match. A suicide bomber just blew himself up at the entrance, killing all the security guards, after which the rest of the Taliban literally walked in with their rocket missiles and AK-47s shooting randomly at everyone they saw. Serena had a huge basement where people could go and hide in emergency situations like this. I believe only a handful were able to reach the basement. A Norwegian embassy reception was being held in an enclosed ballroom but luck was on their side, as except for one of their journalists who had come to the lobby, everyone else survived. The journalists got shot. By then, the police had arrived to help the hotel security staff, and a full-fledged war was going on. The Taliban even managed to enter the spa and gym, despite the complicated route to it. I remember it as a maze. They did not spare Zinia, the masseuse, who was shot and killed instantly. A foreigner running on the treadmill was also shot. I was never able to understand the purpose of this senseless killing. As a Muslim, I could not understand how Muslims killed, could kill in the name of Islam. I felt terribly sad. I could picture Xenia in her white uniform in the spa, surrounded by candlelight and soft background music, telling me about her life in the Philippines. She had chosen to come to Afghanistan to earn money to support her needy family at home. The full realization of how dangerous life could be in Kabul hit me. Any of us could be in the hotel when it happened. To me, it was the place where one met the elite of the country, 
from a minister in Karzai's government to an ambassador or just enjoying a fresh fruit juice under, under the bougainvillea tree in the beautiful garden. We came to the conclusion that there was no such thing as a safe place and we were all vulnerable. Any of us could be at the wrong place at the wrong time. I decided not to let fear overcome me. I had made the choice of, to come here and life for me had to go on regardless. Uh, thank you very much. There's uh, no such thing as a safe place. Um, but uh, uh, probably the least safe place during your three years in Kabul was Delhi. Uh, so uh, maybe, you know, without uh, setting the scene for you, maybe you should tell us about that. <laughs> Delhi, yes. Uh, in my book, the story is called The Delhi Nightmare. <clears throat> I used to, um, going from Kabul anyway, I always had to transit through Delhi. And um, the flight connections were such that I had to always overnight in Delhi. So I had arrived, and I was new in the bank at that time, so I arrived from a trip to visit my children in USA. And I arrived in Delhi at midnight, and um, as I came out, uh, I was able, I was about to register for, you know, you get a receipt, you take a taxi and you get a receipt. A man came running and told me that, why don't you come in my car? It will be much cheaper. I'll take you wherever you want to go. I started going with him, but good sense prevailed. I came back into the, where the taxi stand was, and I took a registered taxi. As I got up in the taxi, and the taxi started moving. By then, it was nearly 12.30 at night. The same man jumped on into the front seat of the moving taxi. And I asked him, why are you in the taxi? And they wouldn't say anything. And it seemed the taxi driver knew this man who had jumped into the front seat. So as we went on along this very uh, lonely road, you know, at that time of the night, there was not much traffic. It was night. I was tired. I was jet lagged. And I was extremely frightened. And I told them to stop at any hotel. And at that time, I didn't know that the bank had guest houses. The bank could have sent me a car. So as we moved along, this, the two men, somehow I had this great fear that something was going to happen. Either they were going to kidnap me for all my luggage. You know, you carry your laptops and everything. And so I just um, took my cell phone and I pretended that I was calling the police officer. I had the receipt, I had the taxi number, and I, in my fake phone call I said, this is the number of the taxi that I'm going in. As we drove along, the man in the front seat somehow jumped out of the car and ran away. But the taxi driver continued. And um, we, we continued, and I kept telling him, take me to a hotel. And he continued, and then he, uh, I passed some CG looking hotels, but he took me to a mud road. And as we entered the mud road, uh, there was a house, a very CG looking house. The gate was open, and he took the, took the taxi into inside that house. And I will never uh, forget this sight. I saw uh, there was an open veranda. And they were all very strange looking men sitting there with their le legs dangling. And this is a sight which I would never forget. And I kept telling me, why have you brought me to this house? You know, I was screaming. And I started screaming. I think maybe, you know, I believe that God heard me or there were angels around me. All of a sudden he decided to turn and come out into the main road again. You know, and these men were looking at me as I was, as the ta taxi was moving very slowly. We came back into the dirt road, and then we went along into one of the CD hotels, and to me, that CD hotel looked like a safe place at that time. So I said, just stop here. So we stopped there, and um, I said, I'm going to check in into this hotel, whatever the hotel is, and you know. So I remember um, the price was over $100. I said, oh my God, anything is all right than being out in the street at that time of the night. And I took a room, and I remember the room didn't even have a proper locking system. And I write in my book that, you know, you see movies where you put a chair under the lock, and I, that's exactly what I did. I went into the bathroom, there was no running water, just a, a bucket full of water, and I just, uh, you know, had a bath, and I thought of all the 160 million people back in Bangladesh, you know, most of them take their baths like that. And to me, I felt that, you know, like, we take so much for granted. And uh, when I woke up in there, I told the uh, reception that wake me up, give me a wake up call. And of course they didn't, and I missed my flight. And uh, for two days I was stuck in Delhi, but I moved out of that hotel into a 
another hotel and that was a, an experience and a, a lesson for me to learn that. Well, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, so uh, one has to perhaps uh, go from Kabul to Delhi to really uh, get completely scared. But I think it's, it's uh, time for a few questions uh, before we wind up. There's about 10 minutes to go, so you're welcome. Uh, gentlemen, please. In, in Afghanistan, Afghanistan, was there any compulsory percentage uh, that you had to recruit from local people in your bank? And were they willing uh, to learn? Um, actually, there was uh, no formal percentage, but we took it upon ourselves. Uh, when I first arrived there, there were five expatriates. And uh, by the time I left, we managed to train up the local people to take over uh, jobs which were, belonged to the expatriates. So by the time I left, there were only three expatriates and the rest were all local people. And we ensured that we trained them up properly. And, uh, and I, I, I think there were six women in the bank. And so uh, our bank uh, uh, was very particular about training. So we used to have training sessions and our bank was like, a uh, lot of people wanted staff from our bank at hired uh, salaries, so it was always like a stepping stone for people. But me, we made sure that we retained them by these trainings, and and the brand image of the bank kept them there. And but uh, we didn't have any formal uh, number that we had to recruit. Ma'am, my question is that you said when you uh, arrived Afghanistan, you found that Standard Chartered Bank is a sponsor to a lot many things. My question is, Afghanistan is a place that has a huge archaeological heritage. I just want to know as an expat, you ever came across with any organization or any individual who approached you, the standard charter's help or any corporate help to protect the losing heritage of Afghanistan? Because every day Afghanistan is losing its Gandhar historical archaeology. Already it lost the Bamiyan Buddhas and gradually everything will go. Everything will go. I just want to know the big multinationals like you or Pepsi, who are sponsoring cricket uh, team there. You ever thought that you people can also put money in Afghanistan to protect one of the oldest civilization of the world? Um, we would love to have, but we didn't, unfortunately. And I'm sorry to say that we didn't, because uh, we had a very small presence there. Uh, physically, we were like a one branch bank. And the main reason we were there was to look after all the big uh, UN organizations because they wanted a global bank to bank with. But um, your question is very good, and I'm very, very sad to say that uh, we did not actually uh, sponsor or... And I know the Bamiyan thing really touched me also because at that time I was living in Dhaka and I was just by chance I was happened to see CNN when the whole thing was happening at that very moment. But we did do a lot of things like uh, we sponsored the eye hospital there where um, cataract surgeries were happening, young children were losing their eyesight. So we used to, we had a project called Seeing is Believing. So we put in a lot of money in that, you know, so to help in that sector. Um, one question, apart from the Taliban and the, you know, well entrenched uh, terrorists, one uh, big thing that Afghanistan faces is kidnappings. We had a Calcutta girl being kidnapped. So did you, of course, had layers of security, but you as a CEO of a multinational, did you kind of get any kind of threats? Or did you know any of your uh, staff had been threatened? Because I believe I met the AFP bureau chief uh, who, was, uh, who practically ran away from Afghanistan because she knew that she would be kidnapped any day. I mean, the threat would come from the landlord, the threat would come from anywhere. And uh, so what's your experience about this? My, my own experience, like as a CEO, I mean, our group always felt that if anything happened to me, it could be kidnapping me for a ransom. Uh, I did have a lot of security, so it didn't happen to me, but that fear was always there. Sorry? I, I, I'm sure the bank would have paid because we, we, <laughs> we, had, we had insurance money for everything. You know, we, we, 
we lost $3 million in a robbery and the insurance paid back that money, although we never got that money back. But the threat of kidnapping was always, always there. And, uh, and I know a lot of things that I did I should not have done against my group security rules and regulations. I should not have gone out uh, to friends' places or out at night going to restaurants. But I did, and in some ways, it was full-heartedly, as Krishnan said, but in some ways, it has made me so much more um, kind of an attachment for that country because I've seen the, the softer side and the lighter side of it. But that th threat was always, always there. But we did get threats like, uh, for example, like uh, uh, um, after there, were, there used to be fraudulent uh, activities all the time. Uh, uh, signatures being forged and all that. And once there was this big fraudulent activity which happened and we had to pay the money back. And uh, so we asked the police people whether they would come and help us, you know, find the people who actually did this fraudulent activity. It turned out that the policemen were threatening us. And they said, we will, uh, we will um, take your people in, uh, and put them in jail because I'm sure it was an inside job. So involving the police people were more of a danger than a help. And, uh, and I remember this particular police officer who came and told me that um, you better uh, give your uh, two uh, front people, um, you know, I have to put them in jail. I'm giving you time, but make sure that you don't tell anybody else because I'm threatening you if you do, it, it could have dire consequences. But I did tell the superior people and they did manage to stop him from harassing us. So those kinds of threats were always there. Thank you, madam. Uh, you have enlightened about the crime against bank. Would you please a uh, little more highlight how was the condition during your period and in not only your bank, all the banks, uh, what was the situation regarding crime against bank? And second is, how is the common people uh, use bank as their day-to-day -day life? Oh, I see. Okay. Yes. Um, the common people, uh, uh, the day-to-day uh, -day life in all banks was like they were uh, very, very big local banks like the Kabul Bank. And, uh, and when, when I first arrived there, not that many people uh, opened bank accounts. They, they felt insecure about keeping money in banks and things. So they'd rather keep the money under their mattresses and things. But soon we were able to educate people to open bank accounts, uh, you know, that the money was saved. But having said that, uh, there were these huge banks uh, uh, which went down. They had uh, very corrupt shareholders and uh, big loans were given out without proper collateral. The banks uh, uh, went down, so the depositors lost their money. So those kind of things were constantly happening. Then there was constant money, money laundering happening. Uh, and uh, even though they put controls in place, but those things continuously happened. And, uh, and uh, was there anything else you wanted to know? Okay, um, thank the, you. the lady, yes. Hello. Yeah. Hi. For, congratulations on your very bold and courageous decision, not only as a woman, but I think uh, it is still uh, a life's decision to uh, move to a country like that for a man as well as a woman. So congratulations to you and your family to have stood by you. Uh, I have a couple of questions. First is, uh, the topic was relating to the glass ceiling uh, for women. So what was in your experience, uh, you mentioned a maid who was a local, but uh, of the six women in your bank, you said they were Nepalese and uh, some other country. So in the workforce overall in the corporate sector, was there any women's participation, local women's participation in white collar jobs? Uh, second is uh, you being from Bangladesh and, you of, and it was also a Muslim country as we have discussed. So what were the similarities culturally or otherwise and what did you find different or unique to Kabul while we were there in your observation? And uh, the third is, yeah. Can you have sorry, Please. do I need to clarify my question? No, no, no. Just go ahead. Okay. And the third is uh, since uh, 
my understanding or information about Kabul is purely literary. I have not been there. So there's this book uh, which, which I read about the underground girls of Kabul where uh, it speaks about girls being raised as boys in their appearance till they uh, attain puberty or uh, re uh, they reach a stage where they need to be married off. Until such time, they're dressed as uh, boys. Have you seen, have you witnessed in your experience these things or is it more a, a, a niche or a, you know, a not so common thing just highlighted uh, for the sake of a book? Or is it something uh, very common as you, even you might have witnessed? Thanks. Uh, I wouldn't say it is very common, but I've heard about those things and about, you said about girls being dressed up as boys to avoid being married. Uh, the, sir, thank you. Uh, it says that the girls uh, cannot uh, walk the streets on their own. They need a male escort. So apparently, at, uh, one of the girls, if there are no boys, uh, even younger ones, so uh, whichever is the toddler, they are dressed uh, and raised as boys till they grow up okay. uh, and become a woman, and then they are married off. And it's a, a conflict <laughs> for them to get adjusted post marriage. And this is all from my readings. I have not been there. From the so book I, that you read. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was by a journalist, so I, I just wanted to know your first hand account. Thanks. Yeah, that, that happened, and I used to hear from my own maid stories like that. But uh, your first, the first part of your question, like breaking the glass ceiling, for me. For me personally, it was like breaking a glass ceiling because I had never thought that I would become a CEO of a country and that too uh, of a foreign bank and I was the first one uh, amongst women in Bangladesh to be a CEO of an international bank and that too in an international country and the people who worked in the bank, they also, a uh, lot of them well, I wouldn't say broke the glass ceilings, but they had very good career moves. The Nepalese girls went back to their country and they're still working for Standard Chartered Bank. And the local banks, our bank unfortunately sold off its business in 2012, but it got bought by another local bank and uh, those girls are still working there and doing very, very well. And, and the second part of your question, I would think it would happen because women would always need an escort to go out. And uh, you see, um, uh, before I went there, I always thought everybody would be kind of in a burqa, but no, they just had their heads covered. There was a lot of intermingling and uh, you went to big coffee shops and there were a lot of young Af Afghan men and women all together, but they always needed a, a male escort. I've rarely seen women go out on their own and being dressed up as boys, I'm sure it, it's true. I mean, it could have I, happened, although I didn't I'd like, see it I'd like to, <coughs> we've got to bring this session to a close. I'd like to, I'm sorry, I, I, I'd like to thank uh, on your behalf uh, Nasreen Sattar very much for, for um, the very lucid way she's uh, um, handled various questions today. I'd like to thank you all for your interest, your patience, and the questions that you've asked. I'm sorry that we didn't have time, but I'm being asked by the organizers to wind up. I'd just like to say about the book that it's a very transparent book. Um, Nasreen never makes the claim that she's a bold person. She never makes the claim that she is an expert on international relations or, or sociology. It's just a book which says, this is what happened to me, this is how it was, and this is how I say it. And I think that uh, she deserves a lot of credit for that. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you.